Okay, we'll consider two more examples of hash functions in action uh, for, for different protocols. Um, so let me give you uh, an example where we use pre-image resistance. So, so far we looked at two examples where we relied mostly on uh, collision resistance, not pre-image resistance. So the example we'll, we'll do next is uh, a password that, or sorry, a, an example that corresponds to passwords. So let's say that we have a user for a website, uh, call her Alice, and Alice wants a Gmail account. Um, so this is a server, and the server is run by Google, and the server uh, maintains Gmail, uh, the Gmail service on, on their behalf. Okay, so what Alice will do is, uh, when she signs up for her account, is she's going to send a password. So we can denote this as the kind of registration phase. And Alice has a password, she chooses it. Hopefully, maybe she has some software that chooses it for her or whatever the case may be. But in any case, the password goes across the wire to Gmail. We'll assume that this channel is secure. There's some encryption or something that, that's protecting it. We'll, we'll just um, obfuscate away what exactly that detail is. And OK, so what Gmail is going to do is what they could do Okay, as a first pass. This is not what they actually do, but this is what, what they, they might do. And a lot of web services do do this, uh, is they might have a really simple kind of file that's sitting on the database and uh, the file has a list of all the users and it has a list of their passwords. So when Alice comes along and registers, they write down Alice and then they write down her password. Okay. Um, then later, uh, Alice is going to come back and she's going to say, hey, I'm Alice. Re remember me, I'm the person who, who registered uh, before. And now I'm ready to log into my, my inbox again. And uh, Gmail is concerned with whether she's the same person or not. So they say, OK, great. If you're, if you're really Alice, then send your password along and, and we'll check it. Um, so Alice sends her password. I'm going to note it as with a prime because maybe this is the right password. Maybe it's not. Maybe this isn't actually Alice. It's somebody that's coming along claiming to be Alice. She's sending this password that's cl claimed to be the right password. And uh, what Gmail will do is they'll go into their list. Uh, they'll pop out Alice's password from the list. And they'll take the thing that was sent to them. Okay, and they're, they're going to ask a really simple question, which is, uh, is the password that is in our list, is that the same as the password that was just sent to us? And if it is, they'll, they'll conclude that Alice is the same person. They'll recognize Alice. Okay, so this is fine. Uh, but what can happen, uh, and it has never happened as far as, far as anyone knows in, in terms of Google, um, but it has happened for major websites on the web, is an adversary will come and uh, somehow the adversary is able to break into the server and they're basically able to download uh, this list. So when this happens, we, we call it a breached uh, password or a password dump. Okay. And if uh, the passwords are all in plain text, uh, as they are, then uh, by plain text, I mean that the passwords are just stored directly in the file, then the adversary now knows all the passwords. Okay, um, so the attack So the adversary breaches the server, steals the passwords. Then what they can do is uh, they can log in as you, okay, or they can sell them to someone else who's going to log into you. So there's impersonation, and uh, I'm told that sometimes people don't use fresh new passwords for every single website that they register for. You probably are registered for a couple hundred websites, um, and so are you, are you really using a unique password for every single one of your websites and in particular, if you're relying on yourself memorizing all your passwords, 
uh, not using some sort of software to generate it for you, uh, there's a good chance that you might reuse passwords uh, across different uh, websites. And, and people have, have done studies of, of real users and, and password reuse is a big problem. So uh, just because they get your Gmail password, they might also have your Facebook password or, or your Twitter password because for a particular user, that user is using the same password on, on all of those sites. Okay, so this is, this is sort of problematic. So is there anything that our, our web server uh, could do or what is it that Google does that's, that's at least a little bit better than this? So they, they actually do about three different things in order to combat uh, this particular problem. Um, and uh, two of them are directly related to hash functions and, and kind of the way that we are going to use hash functions in this course. And, and one's a little bit different, but I'll give you all three of them just so that we can understand a little bit, a little bit better uh, what it is that hash functions get, can do for you, okay? Um, so let's denote this as improvement one. And so in improvement one, uh, Alice will still have her password and she'll still submit her password to the server. So this is during registration. And the server is still going to have a list that looks mostly the same. It has a set of users, it has a set of their passwords. Okay. Uh, and uh, when Alice comes along, they're going to add an entry for Alice. But now what they're going to do is they're going to take the password when they receive it, and they're going to run it through a hash function. And once they've run it through a hash function, they're going to actually forget what the password is. So they're never going to record what the, the actual raw password is. What they're going to record is what's the hash of the password. OK, so how does this? Well, first off, so two questions. One is, how does this help? What problem is it solving? And the second is, are we sure that this works? Right. Like what happens when Alice comes back? Uh, and so let's let's consider the first or the second question first, which is uh, Alice is now ready to actually use her account. And so she uses it exactly the same as before. She submits her password to the server. And I'll denote password prime again for the same reason that we don't know. Maybe this is Alice. Maybe it's someone that's trying to guess her password. Uh, so somebody comes along claiming to be Alice and says, this is allegedly my password. Uh, then the server does what it did uh, during registration is it takes this new password, it hashes it, and then it's going to take this thing and it's going to say, okay, is this the same as the thing that's in the list? Okay, and if it's the same, then we assume it's the same user. And if it's different, we assume that it's uh, not the same user, okay? And because hash functions are deterministic, uh, if you hash the same thing twice, you'll get the same answer. Uh, so as long as these passwords are the same, uh, the password that was registered and the password that's being submitted when the person wants access to the account, then the hashes will end up being the same. And so we'll end up uh, having a match on, on the password list, okay? Now, what's the problem that this is solving? Uh, so let's consider the same attack. So we have an adversary, and the adversary somehow is able to uh, break into the server, breach it, and download the list. Okay. Now the adversary has a list of hashed passwords. Okay. So they have a list of users, and they have hashes of passwords. And there's two questions. One is, can they do anything with the hash of a password directly? And the second thing is, if they can't do anything with the hash of the password, are they able to get the original password out? Okay, so the first question is, can they do anything with the hash of the password? So you might think, well, what if they submit the hash of the password? So they say, hi, I'm Alice, and then they submit the hash of the password. Well, what will happen is the server will take that thinking it's the password, it will hash it again, so you get the hash of the hash of a password, and that will be a completely different value than the hash of the password. So there's no way to trick uh, the server into getting you access. Um, 
unless if you know that raw password because the server is going to hash it. Okay. So the next question, the most natural question is, okay, if you have the hash of a password, can you get the original password out? And this is what pre-image resistance uh, tells you. Uh, this is why we have pre-image resistance. So pre-image resistance says, uh, if you are going to get the original password out, the only way you can do it, the best way that you can do it is just by trying every password. So you can try every password. Uh, and if you happen to get the right one, then when you hash your guess at the password, it will match the actual hash of the password that you have written down. Then you'll know that you have the right password, but there's no direct way uh, to, to get it out. Okay. So there's no way to just look at the hash of the password and, and kind of invert that function and, and get the password back. Okay. A hash is a one way function. So the best you can do is just guess at particular inputs. Um, so that's what improvement one does is improvement one. The adversary now has to explicitly guess your password. Okay. Now there's one. So this is a nice solution. Uh, it goes a long way to uh, making this a, a sort of more secure practice. Um, but it's not perfect, or it could still be improved further. Uh, so one thing is note that the adversary doesn't have to wait until they see the hash of your password to start guessing. What they might do is before they even breach the server, is they might go and take their guesses, maybe a dictionary or a dictionary or concatenated words from the dictionary or dictionaries with, you know, the letter E replaced with the number three, whatever, whatever tricks that they feel that people are playing when they, when they create passwords, uh, they'll create these dictionaries of all the possible combinations of words, uh, including the ones that use these tricks and they'll hash them so that when they breach the server, they're, they're good to go. They already have a hash of all of their guesses. And then when they see your hashed password, uh, what they'll do is they'll just try and match it against this pre-computed list. So computing this list takes a long time because hash functions are very fast, but if you wanna compute a million things, it, it can add up. Uh, it can take some amount of time. Um, so computing these, this list is hard. Uh, so that, that's where the, the most of the computation goes into it, and most of the effort of the adversary. And then once the adversary has the list, then they can use it. Um, uh, they can just use it directly. Uh, so this idea of a pre-computed hash table is, is called a rainbow table. And uh, in particular, the adversary doesn't even have to compute it themselves, right? Maybe they know some other adversary from, you know, that five years ago did this, right? And so what ends up happening is for a popular hash function like SHA-256, um, there's people that just spend their days uh, making up what possible passwords might be and computing hashes of what those passwords are. And then once they have that list, which is expensive to compute, then they just distribute it on file sharing and you can download it uh, with, with all these hashes that are good to go. So you, uh, once a password breach happens, you don't actually have to do the work yourself of, of actually guessing. Uh, you just have to look up the guess, okay? So those are called rainbow tables. Um, there is a way to, to combat that. Uh, it's it's kind of interesting. And um, initially I was thinking it doesn't have a connection to Bitcoin, but it, it sort of does. Uh, it's kind of related to a commitment function. So I'll, I'll mention it. Uh, so improvement two is, uh, first off, it's in response to the fact that we should note that uh, an adversary can pre-compute a set of hashed password guesses. And share it. And so the defense or the response to this is what we need to do is we need to just change. We need to change the password somehow so that um, when you see the hash of the password, it's somehow unique. So like one service that has hashes of passwords, um, like imagine if there were a million variations of a hash function and everyone used a slightly different one or Google even internally for each of their users 
Uh, they use one variant of the hash function, a different variant for each. Then what you would have to do if you want to pre-compute these tables is you would have to pre-compute them for all the different variants of a hash function. Okay, we don't have variants of hash functions. We just have one standard hash function because it's a lot easier. But what we can do that's exactly equivalent to coming up with a kind of unique variant of a hash function is we can pick a random number. So this is called a salt. Uh, so a salt is just a fancy name for a random number. And then what we can do is we can store the hash of the password with the salt either at the end or at the start uh, of the hash, concatenated. So this is concatenation. Okay, and what we'll do is for every user, we'll choose a different salt. The salt will be sitting there in clear text. So the user will come along, they'll say, this is my password. You'll take the salt that's sitting there, you'll hash it together with the password that they're claiming is, is correct with the salt that's sitting there and you'll see whether it matches the second value. If it matches, you let them in, okay? And the idea here is that for every different value of salt, you would have to do a different rainbow table. So if your salt is, say it's a 40-bit number, then there's two to the 40 different rainbow tables and that's way too many to compute. No one can compute two to the 40 different rainbow tables. Um, so what this does is, uh, now the, the adversary can still guess your password, but they have to do the work, okay? They can't get a, a list that someone else pre-computed. Uh, what they have to do is they have to themselves try, because this salt is unique, once they know what that salt value is, then they're gonna to have to run the dictionary through themselves. So what they'll do is they'll hash every word in the dictionary with the salt that corresponds uh, to, the, to the user. And then let's say they're able to break one password for one user. Well, for the next user, the next user will have a different salt value. Uh, so they'll have to redo that work. So uh, the amount, the cost to the adversary of these guessing attacks uh, is proportional to the number of users. Whereas before it was just one attack uh, for the whole set of users. Um, so this is, this is a little bit better. The other thing too is that we've talked a lot and we, we've been a little vague about it uh, and we're gonna be a lot more explicit about it later when we talk about something about proof of work. Um, but what we've talked a lot about is the fact that um, when the adversary does this guessing attack, they have to hash uh, lots of guesses. And there's a cost to every guess that they make. Every time they guess and hash it, even though a hash function is very fast, uh, if, you're, if you're doing a whole bunch of these hashes, uh, it takes some amount of time. It's sort of a drag on the resources of the adversary. And so we can use that to our advantage. What we can do, uh, a third thing is, if we can slow down the hash function, like say we have a hash function that's really hard to compute. So one way of making a hash function that's really hard to compute is we can say uh, when, you, when you hash something, what you're gonna do is you're actually gonna hash it more than once. Uh, so let's say you hash it a thousand times. Okay, so I'm going to use this notation for that. So what that means is I take the password and the salt, I hash it once, I take the output of that hash, I hash that output again, and then I hash it again, I hash it again. Okay, so I iteratively hash it, say, a thousand times. Uh, then this is going to take some amount of time. It's still probably in the milliseconds. Uh, it's still less than a second. Um, and this penalty is going to be paid by both legitimate users and attackers. Okay, so when you go to log into the website, the website now has to hash it a thousand times. So that's not so great for the website and it's not so great for you because you're gonna have to wait a little bit longer. But if you have to wait, you know, a, a couple milliseconds longer, you're probably not gonna feel that as a user and you're not logging in that much. I mean, it feels like you're logging in a lot maybe when you use the web, but uh, the number of times you log in in a day uh, isn't that substantial, okay? Now, if you're an adversary and you're trying to guess passwords and you're trying to guess millions of passwords in fractions of a second, if I slow you down by a, a factor of a thousand, that's a big cost, right? Uh, basically, uh, for, for every one password you can try and guess, uh, before, without this, this slowdown function, you could have done a thousand, okay? So I'm, I'm slowing you down. Um, so anyway, there, there's a whole standard for how you kind of harden passwords against attack that uh, blends together this idea of adding salt 
this idea of actually hashing your password, not storing them in clear text, and also this idea of, of iterating uh, iterating things through through a hash function. Um, not all of them use an explicit hash function. Some of them have slightly different uh, functions, and this area is also undergoing a competition to find a really good primitive uh, to do this. But there's a bunch of of, of things that are, are related to it. So so the main one I'll mention is uh, something called uh, PBKDF2, which is password-based key derivation function. And it basically does this type of approach uh, to a password to, to harden it. Uh, so it's sometimes called password hardening. Um, and there's also uh, another function that does it uh, is, is called scrypt. And we'll come back to Scrypt because there is an application of it in Bitcoin uh, that we'll talk about later. Okay, so that's that's uh, a third example uh, that you've seen now. And let me give you one other example of, of how hash functions are used. This one will be very, very short, uh, which is also linked to what we're going to do uh, for blockchain. And then after this example, we'll switch gears and, and we'll talk about digital signatures. Uh, so example four is, let's say that you have a, um, say you have, let's say you're an inventor and you know, you come along and you invent some uh, particular, you have some discovery, okay? So here's Alice and Alice has, has made some sort of discovery And what Alice wants to do is uh, she wants to kind of lock in the fact that she's made this discovery. Okay, so she wants to, uh, we can think of it as, as sometimes a term that's used as timestamp, the discovery. So the easiest way to do this is just to announce to everybody uh, what the discovery is, and then everyone can know when she announced it. Maybe you put it in the newspaper, there's an article about it, and then um, obviously, you can go in and, um, you know, doctor newspapers, but if it's widely circulated and everyone observes it, then, then it will sort of become known that this discovery was made at that particular time. The problem with this is that, uh, or it's not a problem, but let's say this scenario is slightly different where Alice is kind of concerned about, she doesn't want to disclose it right away because maybe she wants to start a company that's going to exploit this discovery and she doesn't want it to leak and she wants to kind of maintain it as a trade secret. But at the end of the day, if someone else happens to discover it, she wants to be really sure she gets the credit for it. Okay, so she, her primary goal is she wants the credit for the discovery and then her secondary goal is she wants to keep it secret in case someone else uh, discovers it. Okay, so what, what can she do in this particular case? Uh, so this is where she could use a hash function. So what she could do is she could take her discovery, maybe write it up in some sort of document or digitize it somehow. So I'll just put discovery.txt. This is a description of, of her discovery. And then what she could do is she could hash it. Okay. And uh, in, a, in a little bit, we'll talk about a slightly better uh, approach. Uh, but uh, what she can do is she can hash it. She can take the output of this hash function and she could take that and publish that in the newspaper. Okay, so maybe she takes out a classified ad. So she has this newspaper and um, she's going to put this particular value into this newspaper. Uh, then it's going to be published. Okay, and because of pre-image resistance uh, of the hash function, no one can directly figure out what discovery.txt is, okay? The best they can do is make guesses at what that discovery is, and if they happen to word it exactly correct, they could see that it, it comes up to the right hash. Um, but assuming that, I mean, the, the number of possible documents is, is, is too big to enumerate, um, so, so the, that's probably not an attack that's gonna work. Uh, there is a way of combating that attack, uh, so we'll talk about that under uh, commitment schemes, which is somewhere we're, we're going. Uh, but for now, we'll just assume that that no one's going to just blindly guess what this text file is. Uh, so because of pre-image resistant, you can't look at why and figure out what discovery.txt is. So it's perfectly safe to publish this, this hash. 
And then later, if someone else makes that same discovery at the same time, then Alice can go and say, well, here's discovery.txt. Here's the fact that this hash was published in this widely circulated newspaper. Right, you can go out and get a copy of that, that newspaper. And there's no way that this value could have been published in this newspaper unless if I knew the pre-image to this value, if I knew the input that created this output because of the hash function. There's no way to start with the output and then compute what the input should be. Um, so this is a, a sort of secure way of timestamping. And it's, it's not, uh, you might say, well, like I've never heard of this. Like, does anyone actually do this? And it turns out that uh, people do do this, okay? There is a variant of this protocol that's also directly related to Bitcoin where people do this type of thing uh, with real newspapers that are in circulation today. The final thing I'll mention is that there is a kind of folklore way of solving this problem, which is uh, what if Alice uses the postal system? So she'll take her discovery, she'll write it up and print it out, and she'll put it in an envelope. And the, the folklore sort of goes that if she mails it, then the postal service is going to timestamp it. And it's hard to forge these timestamps. And uh, so what she'll do is she'll mail it to herself, she'll get the timestamp of the postal service, and then she'll leave it sealed. She won't open it herself. And then if there's ever a court case or you know later someone else discovers it and she wants to prove to the press or something like that, she'll pull out this envelope, say, hey, it's never been open, it's still sealed, it has the timestamp of the postal service, therefore it must have been mailed before the date on the timestamp, therefore I must have known about this discovery before the date on this timestamp. Um, so that's a really nice protocol and it, it sounds like maybe it works and it raises questions of how secure envelopes are and how secure these stamps are that the, the post office uses. Um, but the big problem with that protocol is if you mail yourself an empty envelope that's unsealed, the post office will still timestamp it. So you could just mail yourself a, an empty envelope that has nothing in it. The post office will timestamp it. Then later, if Bob happens to discover something and you want to take credit for it, you'll write up a description of what Bob discovered. You'll put it in this envelope and seal it. And all of a sudden, it looks like something that was created you know, a year before or two years before, whenever it was that you mailed this empty envelope to yourself. So that protocol has, has no actual uh, security to it. But this, this application of hash functions is actually a, a sort of sensible approach. And it is approach, as I mentioned, that, that is used in real life. Uh, so we'll circle back to the real life example because it's a little bit more elaborate in terms of how they get a whole bunch of documents into a single hash value. Okay, so next, next time we'll uh, talk about digital signatures.